First of all, I'd like to um, acknowledge the continuing sovereignty um, of this country and of the Ghana people. Um, my name is Teela Watson. I'm also known as Ancestress. I'm a Birigaba and Kangaloo, or some people say Gungaloo, Murray woman from Central and North Queensland. And um, to start off, I want to share a story of a dance from my grandfather's country um, and Alexis's country as well, Birigaba country. And the name of the dance is Mayawumba. And it's a dance about honey. And in the dance, um, usually a, a man walks out and he is a tree. And the dancers go around and they slowly cut the tree down. And when the tree's cut down, they go to get the honey. But then they get stung. And so this is um, obviously a dance that was created shortly after the first boats come in. And um, they brought their bees, because native bees don't sting. So this is an example of theatre um, being used as a warning in in our own terms. Um, yeah, so it's, just wanted to share that because we had, you know, we're the, the first theatre happened here and, and it happened to educate. So, um, yeah. I'm gonna start reading off the page here. I was, I want to ask that if anyone feels at any time while I'm reading, if anyone feels resistant to um, anything that I say, I just want to ask that you acknowledge that, that you save it so that you can keep listening and that you go away and interrogate what was it that made you feel uncomfortable or resistant. I was asked to talk about our culture and the planet in the last two years. I wanted to take the opportunity to not only look at the, what the last two years have been like, but also how things got this way and where we might go from here. I've realised in the last two years how quickly two years can go, how much can happen in two years and how important the next two years are. So I'll start at the beginning, beyond 60,000 years ago, because this is still how I and many of us locate ourselves. When I say that I'm Kungaloo, I'm acknowledging that for tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of years, one parent of every child in my bloodline has come from that country. By identifying myself in this way, I locate myself and my children through my family from now since 60,000 years ago and into the future. I'm also acknowledging the relationship that we had with our country a relationship that has grown and been sustained through highly sophisticated and refined, refined forms of substantive eco-science and of course many, many generations of eco-scientists or Murrays in our terms. I'm real dry when I write seriously. Okay. <laughs> because in all that time, we didn't just survive on or off our land but we thrived with it through a complex balance of relationships with which ensured that our existence was sustainable and abundant. Furthermore, it's safe to say that prior to colonialism, every inch of this continent was regularly maintained sustainably by First Nations groups through similar relationships. But it wasn't just our relationship with land that was sustainable in this way. Our relationships required and thrived of social sustainability as well. Our borders never changed. At times they may have adjusted because of the ice ages that we survived, well, thrived through. <laughs> but there was never open warfare and the idea of stealing land just did not exist. Our borders never changed. In 60,000 years, until native title. 
A lot can be learned in 60,000 years. Yet First Nations people continue to suffer from genocide in this continent. In the last two years, 200 years and the last two weeks. Two of the most productive methods of colonialism are myth-making and dehumanization. When we make someone the other, it becomes acceptable to give them less respect, like we've seen happening in the public debates around same-sex marriage. Saying a group of people are subhuman or a missing link is like handing out licenses to kill. Because if humanness is denied, it's much easier to feel less guilt in withholding rights, killing, stealing, and lying. Then this negative gaze has been so useful for so long that it's often hard to shake. My late father, Dr. Russ Watson, he was born in 1944. He passed away in 2013. He knew all the trees in the bush by name. He tried to get me to learn, but never really stuck. He knew how to find food, read tracks, and even how to burn country in order to keep it clean and healthy. He used to say that colonialism invented wilderness, labing, labeling our bushland inhospitable, hostile and unforgiving. Uh, sorry, unforgiving. This negative gaze that they created to talk about our country is similar to the gaze that they invented to talk about us. Just as another black death in custody is often seen the same way as just another mine or just another farm. A few more AFL players leaving end up leaving the sport because of being racially vilified, like a few more non-native animals kill a few more native ones and destroy a few more habitats. It's been said that in the last two years, around 50% of the Great Barrier Reef has died. This continent has the highest extinction rate for plants and animals in the world. And our government continues to push for the Adani Carmichael mine. The Queensland government estimates that the mine will run for 25 to 60 years. And yet the top climate scientists are telling us that we have just three years to drastically decrease our unsustainable practices if we are to survive, not thrive, survive. America are largely still massive cultural influences and through the internet and social media, we all know now that black lives matter, or we should. We know about Standing Rock, maybe even about the horrible effects of fracking in America. Much closer though, you may have heard about the murders of First Nations people in custody, or that over 80% of the Northern Territory is covered in licenses and applications for fracking. In the last five years particularly, more and more people are becoming very seriously politically engaged. Right across the continent and the world, people are starting to wake up to what is happening socially and ecologically as well. Part of this, I think, is because it's cool to be woke. In this era of technology and social media, we've seen capitalism reach new heights in the way that it connects so intimately with each of us. The tools that we have today are surpassing so many that we have had in the, last, in, in the past, and yet still we find ourselves in the midst of a global crisis. With the world's wealth of information literally at our fingertips, a few seconds from consumption at all times, we still haven't been able to turn global warming around, nor have we been able to find balance in our social relationships locally or globally. All the while, climate change is no longer on its way. In the last two years, there have been many catastrophes all over the world. In the last two weeks, it was Puerto Rico, which was hit with two hurricanes in a matter of weeks. There's currently no electricity, no fully functioning hospitals, water and food are scarce, and there are three and a half million people in urgent need of support. This is what climate change looks like. Millions of people losing their homes and their livelihoods displaced at threat, vulnerable. If we are to survive climate change, colonialism, racism and capitalism surely cannot. It no longer could be, can be at the heart of mainstream culture. We must ask ourselves if the current foundations that Australian culture relies on 
are strong enough to enforce the solutions and sustain the solutions required for human survival in this continent. We know that there are more sustainable ways to live, both in relation to land and socially, and this knowledge, despite being the oldest living knowledges on Earth, are extremely and have been extremely dynamic and are still accessible. Now, I want to be very clear that what I'm suggesting is that we strengthen our relationships. I'm suggesting that we start to identify how we can live with land as opposed to through the killing of it. I think the technology of today and genius of over 60,000 years of compiling and refining substantive bio, psycho, social, eco, science research, creating a future is definitely possible, even in the next three years. I often wonder, if land was not commodified in the name of progress, would necessities need to be monetized? Would this incredible power imbalance be attainable, sustainable? If necessities were not monetized and poverty non-existent, would we still see such massive amounts of people ready and willing to poison and attack the only physical giver of life? My auntie, Dr. Lilla Watson says, we need to make the future stretch as far in front of us as it does behind us. So in only three years, how do we embed respect for land in our processes, both in the stories we tell and in the production? How do we as artists, thinkers and creators and influence of in influences of culture disrupt the negative view of land and people and remind people of all of our inherent goodness. Because surely we are all some ways inherently good. How do we create or enhance culturally, socially and ecologically sustainable relationships between each other and between ourselves and the planet? For me, as an artist, the answer is that I'm working with two elders um, elders who have been interpreting culture for over 25 years academically. And so what I'm doing with them is responding to climate change, problems with governance, or just, you know, I mean, governance is a problem at the moment. <laughs> so responding to that. Um, <laughs> and so I'm going to make music, I'm going to make film, I'm going to make theatre, I'm going to make anything that I possibly can that isn't going to be boring for me. Because, you know, you've got to love what you do. If, if your heart's not in it, you won't be able to stay up all night when you have to. <laughs> it's just straight up. Um, so that's my answer. And I'd like for you to go away and think about what is your answer. Thank you very much.